Which ones? Bought me. I prefer zoology so much. I had a I took a botany class. The biology of vascular plant. It's a good class. We started with the moss. I think we're back with the moss. We do words. We ended with flowering plants. I'll say this, like, I can understand the significance of why you take on. I, I do, I really do. It's really hard to tell somebody's structures, <laughs> especially when it's only pictures and not like in person slides. Mm -hmm. That's what's getting me. For sure. I want to say, I think our class is at 8 a.m. On a Tuesday, Thursday, I believe. Our, uh, our professor was always had, had clever points. <laughs> Interesting. All right, so uh, <clears throat> exams. I'll, uh, I'm going to take a look at them for questions that a lot of people missed. Consistently missed, so I can double check just to make sure the answer from Google is correct uh, and so forth. Did everybody remember to take the lab? We got the lab practical today. So we'll do the same thing. I'm going to wait till everyone takes it and I'm going to look through it. Uh, they have something on Blackboard called like an item analysis, and I, and I don't pay attention to like the, the predictive ability for the grade. What I do is look to see the average grades for the questions and look for ones where like the average grade is less than 50% because of that, that suggests that maybe the answer key is wrong or maybe it was a, you know, a, 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 I'll say a deceptive question. It's like, well, maybe it's pointing here, maybe it's pointing there, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and I'll kind of ma make, a, make a ruling on those questions, but we'll, we'll look through those. Also, on the lab practical, there are questions where I ask, what is the name of the parasite? All right, what's the genus? I can tell you that if you give me the species, it will automatically be marked wrong. because I only put in the genus, that's what I asked for in the key. But when I go through and actually look at it, I will look at the answers. And if you give genus and species, you know, you'll get it marked correct. If it is a misspelling of the genus, you know, as long as it's close to the spelling, I, I'll, I'll fix it. Capitalization is, is typically ignored. Um, it just depends on, on how I make the key. So we'll look at those. We finished up the nematode introduction. That quiz is posted. Uh, I put the due date Monday at 11.30 at night. So you can kind of, now that at, you know, as we're finishing up platy Hellman, so you can kind of start shifting to the nematodes. Uh, start reviewing the introduction. Uh, we'll see some of these structures uh, in the lab. All right, and as you look through it, I want you to remember and kind of compare it to what we've seen in like the platy Hellman things. All right, uh, we won't ask. I won't ask those questions on the these tests or the quizzes. Like, hey, how is this different from the platy Hellman things? But those are good, like final exam questions. So if you kind of start doing some of those comparisons and adding a spot in your notes that says, hey, this is, this is completely different from the diagenes, it'll help you uh, study when you go back and actually start reviewing the platy helmet piece again or start reviewing the nematode uh, section again. All right. So what we did was we did the introduction and then we said next up is the diversity. What I've been doing, what I'm doing with this diversity is breaking it up. So instead of having, you know, a hundred slide presentation, I've broken it up into invertebrate hosts. So these are the parasites, or the adult parasitizes, typically the adult, could be the juvenile, uh, parasitizes the, an invertebrate host. Uh, we're going to have vertebrate hosts, uh, a diversity of vertebrate hosts, but those are further broken down because with our vertebrate hosts, we're going to have those parasites that uh, will those parasites that are 
GI tract residents, so they live in the GI tract, we're going to have those parasites uh, that are tissue dwellers, so the outside of the GI tract, and then we'll have nematodes that uh, possess thickosomes, thickosomes, which um, kind of play an important role in their life cycle. So as we get through those, I think four, well, this is one, and then the other three vertebrates. Once we finish those, then we'll move to the canthocephalins. And the canthocephalins, I believe, is just a single presentation. So the canthocephalins actually represent a fairly small, small part. We'll probably spend a day and a half lecturing on those. So first up is the invertebrate hosts. All right. Now, invertebrates, as a definitive host, arose independently in four main groups. So you're going to see kind of a transition with like our, our classification, kind of emphasizing classification, because the examples that we're using, I'm pulling most of these examples because of their importance with humans. Right, we've got a lot of nematodes out there. So this insect, or this invertebrate as a definitive host, seems to be basal within those groups that also contain vertebrate parasitizing nematodes. Right, so it's, it's probably likely, or at least this infers, that maybe the invertebrate host was the ancestral trait, and then we had transition to a vertebrate host. Doesn't necessarily have to be that way, but in those groups that contain both invertebrate and definitive invertebrate and vertebrate infecting nematodes, the invertebrate ones are basal. Now, three groups are primarily insect parasites. Steiner nematidae, heterorhabditidae, and myrmithidae. Right, that fourth group tends to, tends to infect more crustaceans. So, we, I present these three because these three groups have been used as biological control agents. Control agents of our insect pets. I haven't checked Olive's nursery, but I, if I went down there, I wouldn't be surprised if I found some packs of nematode eggs that are going to be out to try to control insect pests. Now, of these three families, we're only going to hit two of them. We're only going to do Steiner nematidae and Myrmithidae because the heteroraptidae has a very similar life cycle as, as, a Steiner, as those members of the Steiner, Steiner nematidae chain. Man, these are just awful. Mouth, mouth. All right. So we're going to basically do two things. Mm -hmm. I would guess we, we could find some of these here if we want. Ready? All right, so we're going to start with the family Steiner nematidae. These are entomopathogenic nematodes. These are these parasitic nematodes that, that infect the insects. All right, they are used as biological control agents. This is a, a diagram to kind of demonstrate it. These are uh, like mealybugs, mealyworms. That this is what it looks like before infection, uh, and then B and C are after infection. ND. So you can see that basically, once you get infected, that insect is going to end up dying. They, they typically die pretty quickly. The infective stage is a J3 Dower larva. Right, and in our textbook, we have a box uh, that talks about a Dower larva. And I believe the box is talking about a different parasite, Strongyloides turboralis, which I think next week we'll have a presentation on a presentation in lab. So what is a dower larva or a dower juvenile? It's basically a juvenile nematode that is experiencing developmental arrest. And typically it goes under this developmental arrest because of unsuitable conditions. Now you may have heard the, the 
nematode Xenorhabditis elegans, or C. elegans, you probably encountered it. You can culture those in the lab, no problem. And you can induce the formation of the dower larva in those worms. That's actually how we know a lot about this process, and a lot about uh, the movement to a dower larva or the hypobiosis that's from Xenorhabditis elegans. All right, so this is a form of hypobiosis. I, I haven't really defined it here, but what the hypobiosis is is like less than life. It's basically they're shutting their systems down and just forming a, re a resting stage. Some are going to be more resting than others. So in the ecology class, I talk about resting stages as basically a complete shutdown of activity. All right. Some nematodes will basically do that, and, and we'll talk about it. All right. But others are just basically they stop developing, and then they enter kind of a, a low movement, low metabolic state. All right, so dower larvae are, could be considered one of those lower metabolic low movement states. These larvae are the infected stages. The reason why they do that is because it increases our infectivity window. All right, same idea as, as medicine carries, same idea as insistent. We're, we're lengthening that amount of time, which uh, increases our chance of actually succeeding in finding a new host. Now these nematodes, Members of the Steimer, Steimer nematidae, as well as the hetero, well as the heterorhabditidae, possess symbiotic bacteria in their gut. All right, and this is a true form of mutualism. All right, what's mutualism? It's our uh, symbiotic relationship where both parties are going to benefit, benefit from this relationship. So for the nematode, they're going to benefit because they utilize those bacteria as a food source. And you could say, well, hold on, if they're living in the gut, how is that a food source? You'll see, you'll see. They feed on it. Some of these bacteria survive the gut. The bacteria benefits because it utilizes the nematode as a vector. All right, so here's a vector. Here's a new term. Well, not necessarily a new term. Go back to the very first presentation where we introduced definitions of all of those parasitological terms, that vector is the transmission agent. So our bacteria are going to use the nematodes to get from one host to another host. Why is that important? Because the bacteria are going to actually live and feed on the inside of the host. Ready? All right. So this symbiotic relationship, this mutualistic relationship, species-specific, with a genus and species, species of our nematode and species of bacteria. They're going to they basically go all together. All right. So our example life cycle that we're going to use is Steiner Nemo. All right. Steiner Nemo. Its symbi its symbiotic bacteria is members. We just left it as species. But it's members of the genus Xenorhabditis. Right. So, this is going to be a different life cycle, different diagram. This will be a different diagram than how we have diagrammed them before. So, we also open up, <clears throat> open up the size for anyone that's watching. All right, Steiner Niemann. So our J3, the dower larva, is our infective stage. Good. All right, so J3 gets, uh, we're going to start actually right here. Dower J3s.
set toast. This is our environment. So our Dower J3s are going to get into an insect. They can be consumed. They can enter via the anus or through the spear. Entry the mouth, hands, or spear. Once inside, the J3s are going to get to the hemocene, the body cavity. So if it enters in through the mouth, it's going to penetrate out of the gut into the hemocene. If it comes in through the spiracles, it's going to uh, get escape that brachial tree into the hemocene. Comes in through the anus, so you're going to have to get out of the gut again into uh, into the anus. All right. Once we get here, once we get here, switch colors. Our J three is will release the bacteria. In our hemocene, the bacteria are going to replicate. And they're just going to keep replicating because with what has happened is that they are feeding on basically the tissues and the tissue fluids of these insects. So we've got replication going on. Alright, so far so good. What do you think is going to happen at this point? This is ultimately going to kill the host. This is what ultimately kills the host. That's not the only thing that's going to happen, is because these bacteria, as they're replicating, will also release antibiotics. They'll produce an antibiotic that doesn't really necessarily hinder it and hinder this bacteria, but it prevents the growth of other bacteria. So, that's a good thing, because the bacteria are able to grow, replicate, all right, do all that other stuff. Now, what about these larvae? So, the J3s. Well, the J3s got in there. They released, the, the, they released those bacteria. They then are going to molt to the J4. Then they will molt to our adult stage. We're still in our hemocene. And then our adults are going to reproduce. Produce our egg. The egg hatches to the J1 stage. The J1 stage molds the J2. J2 stage molds to the J3, which then molds to the J4 to the adult, and so forth. So overall, what's happening is this nematode inside this hemocyte is replicating growing, replicating, and feeding on the bacteria that is inside and, re and replicating itself. All right? We see one to three generations of the nematode inside the host. 
we see one to three generations. So the egg never never leaves. The egg comes out, the egg hatches, releases the J1, J2. All of this growth and reproduction requires energy. They derive that from the bacteria that ultimately kill the host. Now, there is this, a trigger, though. All right, there's a trigger where, for some reason, the, back, the nematode is going to know things are going down to because you kill the insect, the bacteria are going to consume all that's out there, food source is going to decline. So then what ends up happening is some of these J2s will transition to a dower larva. That's a molt. And these dower larvae that then escape from that dead body get into the environment where they can hang out until they find a new insect. Yeah, it's our J3 escapes from the host and now we're out in the environment. Okay. Yep. Yeah, J3 escapes and we're now out in the environment. Yep. Um, so which organism releases the antibiotics? Or bacteria. The bacteria. The bacteria. Yeah, the bacteria releases kind of keep other bacteria. Questions? Yep. Can we use that antibiotic? Uh, uh, good question. I'm I'm sure some people are, have looked at it. Yeah. We do use Steiner Nema, Steiner Nema as a uh, control agent on these eggs. But they had, yeah, so they have the bacteria. So these worms, these nematodes, are feeding on the bacteria. They have the bacteria in their gut. So not only did they release them, but they now possess them, and that's those J1s and J2s, those are feeding. So they get bacteria, they're going to retain the bacteria as a dour J3 larva, so that they carry it into our next host. Yep. Does it kill others of their species? The antibiotics? Yeah. Not done. It's targeting others, other bacteria. All right. Back. Okay, we'll have a second life cycle. All right. So, how quickly does this happen? Typically, the host is dead in 48 hours. This is a very rapid killing of, of, of that insect host. Now, resistance depends on the insect's ability to recognize and encapsulate the nematode. So this isn't like any insect this can be infected with this. There is some host specificity. And a lot of that is tied to the insect's ability to recognize that nematode as a foreign invader and then kind of wall it off and kill it off. Right? The better you are at that, the more resistant you are to the infection. All right. Now, this worm still has to deal with the host immune system. Because insects do have an immune response, no matter how prim primitive you consider it. This worm exhibits two methods of immune evasion. We are going to fix that. There we go. Two methods of immune evasion. First one is molecular mimicry. So it seems like some of these hosts don't recognize it, or at least in those hosts, we said resistance depends on the ability of the insect to recognize. If the insect doesn't recognize it as foreign, there's probably something going on there. One of those is this molecular mimicry. It just doesn't see it as a foreign invader. Now, why is that, or how does that accomplish it? It's been proposed, and it's been kind of reappearing in these textbooks, that it's possibly associated with that lipid layer of the cuticle. So the, the lipid layer of that epicubicle, because that is where our lipids uh, mostly composed, 
to that layer. And the second thing is that these worms do suppress the immune system. Right? They secrete proteolytic enzymes that destroy the antibacterial compounds that are produced in the insect. So the insect has these, as part of its, its immune response, have, they have these antibacterial compounds. So the worm comes in there, starts secreting some enzymes that break them down to try to inhibit their action. Why would that, why would they do that? Well, because the worm wants its own bacteria to take hold. So they're kind of giving the bacteria a leg up, giving them a little bit of help to get established until they get to the point where they ultimately just kill the host. Now, this enzyme is specific for the various host species. This is also one of these things that kind of confers uh, host specificity. Adult nematodes in invertebrate hosts are not very common. But we have, and I, I, found, I found some. Found some, looked at them. That's how I learned about Steiner Nemo. Uh, but we figured out what, what species it is. All right. Good with this? All right, so uh, this life cycle pattern, all this stuff also applies to this heteroarachnid today. So we're, we're not even going to talk about it. We're do, we just do Steiner, Steiner Nemo. Members of the Mermithidae are a little bit different in that they are only parasitic as juveniles. So they, have, they will have to leave the host before becoming an adult. And this typically results in the death of the host. So what does this sound like? Like, they, where they don't have to be parasites. Okay, facultative, okay, so facultative parasitism as an adult. In this case, we actually need the parasitism in the juvenile. What other thing? You didn't hear anything? And I said, give me an example of something like this. What, what would it be? Oh, disappointed. A xenomorph. What's a xenomorph? Oh, from aliens. From aliens. Where do you think they got the idea? Parasites. Right? That must have sat in, sat in parasitology. <laughs> It's a, it's, it's a good one. All right. But as, we, as we'll see, uh, this pattern is very similar to the life cycle pattern of the nematomorpha. So different thought. So our juveniles are parasitic, and our adults need to be in the environment, and they require water for further development and reproduction. All right. So that, that water requirement is a loose water requirement. In some cases, you actually do need like liquid water, you know, standing water, you know, a standing body of water. In other cases, moist soil will be sufficient. But you need that water. These things can actually reach a pretty large size. So if you see it, one of these things, it's not going to be sort of a surprise for you to misidentify it as an anatomorph because an anatomorphs also get very large. Like this one, this is Mermis nigrescens. I will go over the Mermis nigrescens life cycle. But that, I mean, that's, that's our worm coming out of this, this uh, grasshopper. Oh, probably a, what, a katydid? Would be a better, better term for it. All right, so our adults are going to reproduce in water or moist environments. They're not going to feed. Right, they're... All of the energy that they that they need to survive has been stored up from their time inside that insect host. Now their energy source is probably lipids. They're probably using that as lipids. And how do they accomplish that? Well, what will end up happening is their intestine becomes modified into a food storage organ called the trophosome. All right. And there's a couple papers that kind of 
do cross sections and, and, and map out the differences, we're not we're not going to worry about it. Just as long as you know that it's the intestine's been modified into this food storage or, organ that has basically these these lipid lipid chambers. It, that's probably where they're driving their energy for them to get out and reproduce. Right. So members of this family typically infect insects. However, some members can also infect spiders and crustaceans. So are there spider myrmithids here? Good question. A lot of the ones that I found, like going into scorpions and some other spiders, have been reported from like, the Middle East. It's a, it might be a case that where no one's really looked, or maybe there really isn't anything here. All right, so the key feature of this family is the presence of a stigosome. Now, if you kind of heard that term before, it's because I mentioned it. Our vertebrate diversity is going to be stichosome-bearing nematodes. This is a family that actually has a stichosome. So what is a stichosome? It's a collection of glandular cells that are called stichocytes that ultimately surround the esophagus. This a little bit down. That's better. All right. So the stichocytes are the individual cells. Those are the glandular cells. The, the stichosome is the collection of all of those. And we have a worm. Whipworms have stichosomes. And you're going to see the actual stichocytes, the, 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 you know, the big, long line of stichocytes uh, in that one. Now, in this family, our stichosome is going to be composed of either 4, 8, or 16 stichocytes, which is much less than what's found in Trichurus trichura, which is, are the whipworms. And this is just kind of a comparison. So when we see Trichurus whipworm, you're going to see the esophagus that is really long, and you've got stichocytes basically along that entire length, whereas in this agamaris, uh, it's, the cells are going to be larger, fewer along the length of the esophagus. These juveniles also have a protrusible stylet. It's likely used in penetration of the host. So we've, we've kind of mentioned stylets in our platy helmets. Some of our cercaria have the stylets. They're used in penetrating um, penetration of that host. So these guys do have a stylet. Some free living nematodes have, have stylets as well. Now there's three main life cycle types in this, this family. There's an aquatic cycle. And then there's two different terrestrial cycles. All right, we're going to go over two of them. We're going to go over an aquatic cycle, Romanomeris uh, cubis florax, and then uh, for one of the terrestrial patterns, we'll go over Mermis nigrans. We don't have a, a, an example of that second pattern because so you'll see the pattern's basically the same. It just there's a different trigger for getting the, the females up to deposit eggs. That's really the difference between patterns one and pattern two. Ready for this? All right. Romano Romano Mermis Julisoborax uses biological control. Skeeter Doom. Great, great name, right? Skeeter Doom. I wish I could find some of this. Obviously, it was used only a short time. You don't typically see it. I think some chemical control is a whole lot better. But if you want to avoid dumping chemicals in here, you can raise some of these. All right. So, what is our life cycle? Go over our life cycle. This is our aquatic life cycle. Hopefully, you can guess that our host is going to be mosquito. It's part of their species name. Culus of Borax. Culus is a genus of mosquito. I don't know where you get the romance. 
and where Romano is. We're going to back to a more normal life cycle pattern right now. All right, so our adults, non-feeding, are out in the environment. All right? They are going to deposit eggs when they get out there. And it takes about 7 to 10 days. Of course, temperature dependent. So cooler temperatures are going to lower the temperatures. And by the way, if you see any of this stuff, I got loads of mosquito larvae in, in my, my pool right now. So if someone wants to dump it in and see how, how effective it is, free, free spot to try. All right, anyways, we've got eggs. Seven to ten days, eggs start to be produced. All right, the eggs are going to develop. So inside of our egg, we will have a J1, and then it develops into a J2 stage. All right? This transition is going to be temperature dependent. All right, temperature dependent, and it needs water. So these eggs depend on water. Not because they're sensitive to desiccation, but they need the water to hatch. All right, so if these eggs get deposited and all, all of a sudden you know, water levels drop and it ends up being dry, the eggs are just going to sit there because they are des desiccation resistant. Which is a good thing. You don't want these things hatching in dry environment because the juveniles are just going to die. So, once we get to the J2 inside the egg, it is now ready to hatch to release these J2s. Now, the J2s are very short-lived, right? They're very short-lived, and they have to find a mosquito bug. Very short way, they have to penetrate into a mosquito larva. And they, they, they go through the cuticle, so they probably go through the junctions between the cuticular plates. It tends to be the thinnest, thinnest portion for them. All right? So inside our mosquito larvae, the J2 molds to the J3 stage. All right? And then once we get to the J3, we are going to have very rapid enlargement of our worm. Rapid enlargement of the worm in our hemocele. I probably should have said it was in the hemocele to begin with. Penetrates and gets to the hemocele. But we have rapid enlargement, and then once it gets large enough and it's ready, it's going to molt. But retain the J3 cube. So this will be like the J4 stage, but it retains that J3 cuticle. Yeah, we're good. We're still on there. Alright. So once we have that now. Our J fours can be released, and how do they get out? They're going to rupture and kill the host. Just like a xenomorph. Rupture and kill that host. Now, that happens about seven to eight days post infection. All right? 
So once we have the penetration into the larva, seven to eight days later, that larva is going to be killed. Why so quickly? Fill the water. Fill the water. And? There's more mosquito water. Uh, mosquito larvae, their development is temperature dependent. So in, in warm areas, from egg to adult could happen in about 10 days or so. so it's it's got to happen quickly because we want that J4 to get out, all right? So J4 with the J J3 cuticle, and then very rapidly it sheds that cuticle that we have a J4. Right? That J4 then will burrow into the substrate. This is basically in the water. Burrow in the substrate, and then once it gets into the substrate, then we will have our molt. So our adult stage, where they then try to find a mate. All right, we've already said now that these eggs are desiccation resistant, but they depend on water. This is an aquatic cycle. So it needs that water in order to hatch. We also said that these are very short-lived. All right, J2s are very short-lived. How short-lived? Depends on temperature. So it's less than one day. 30 degrees Celsius, which is pretty short. Whoa, 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 it's, it's temperature dependent, so it just be in a cooler area. You're right, you're right, I give you that. They can only survive two days at two degrees. <laughs> Very short. Right. Now, how do they find that mosquito load? And I think this is this is an interesting. This is part of the adaptation to the environment. So we have adaptations that increase transmission, desiccation resistance, and then being dependent on water because that next host lives in the water. All right. So the other thing is that it doesn't look like it doesn't look like these things are chemotactic. So you put put them in. You you tether some mosquito larvae to a place. That they don't seem to go towards the mosquito. Instead, it seems like these things secrete some compound that attracts the mosquito larvae to them. All right? What does that? Well, it's thought that the amphids do this. So what are the amphids? Glandular cells. What do they do? What is their second role? Plasmids are the, are the related ones. Where are they? So the glands that I think that you're thinking of are the stickocytes. Okay. They are what? And? Yeah, amphids, chemosensory organs. They're also glandular, so they can secrete some stuff. So things that this is one of the secretions. So the amphids seem, or it might, Secrete and attract it. They might secrete and attract, and that, that will draw mosquito larvae to them. That's different from being chemotactic and, and finding their host. The other thing is that these things are negatively geotactic. And what was that one again? Yeah, they move away from gravity. Yep, away from the ground, basically. 
So they, they move up, or they try to swim up into the water column because that's where our mosquito larvae are. All right, and they are positively big modes active. A new word, big mode tactic. They are drawn to touch. So they would prefer to be attached or on some sort of substrate or vegetation or something compared to being free in the water column. So that's our Figmo tactic. And that's our, that's our life cycle. Now how do these things feed? They're feeding inside the mosquito bar. And the primary way in which they feed is through transcuticular uptake. So they absorb glucose from that, that hemolymph. And they utilize that glucose for their, their energy. They think maybe there's some consumption in the esophagus and the intestine, but by and large, this is transcuticular uptake. Questions? Interesting life cycle, right? We tried to use it for biological control. Do they infect anything else? No, this one's mosquitoes, mosquito larvae. So, I mean, we've tried various control measures. Mosquito fish introduced those in numerous places. Don't have a whole lot of luck because mosquito fishes feed on other things. But, uh, yeah, so this is our aquatic life cycle. What we're going to do on Monday is talk about the terrestrial life cycle. We'll diagram it. Uh, and then what we'll do is move to those stickosome bearing parasites. So right now the invertebrates, basically the effect that, that they have on us is more one of biocontrol. All right. All right, cool. You guys have a good week, good weekend. Don't forget the last practical. Yeah. It's too late tonight. No guarantee that I will be awake at 11.30, so. No guarantee that what? That I'm awake at 11.30, so. Don't wait until then to start.